All right, hey, Flip Geometry, you ready for your next lecture? Just as a reminder, again, don't bother writing everything down right now. Just listen, pay attention, and let your, your mind cue in on the visual and verbal cues right now. Try to just understand the lecture. Then open up your book and take some notes out of that. Okay, that way you've read and heard, and uh, the information is, is washing over you twice and not arguing with itself. Okay, so we're going to look, be looking at undefined terms and definitions. The beginning of the section just talks about what makes a good definition, and then we're going to talk about some things that are undefined, and then give you a, our first uh, set of definitions that are truly geometric terms. So we're jumping now into objects and spatial relationships that makes up the classic um, story of geometry. Okay, so let's get into it. All right, what makes a good definition? There are five characteristics that your book gives. Um, and uh, don't get too stressed out about this because honestly, the only time you're going to be asked is this a good definition or not is in this chapter. The rest of the time, they're going to give you good definitions. So um, don't get all into a turmoil about, oh, I don't know if it's good. It's okay. Survive, breathe, you'll be okay. Um, and a good definition is accurate. It actually does its job, right? It states the term being defined and clearly communicates the concept of avoiding ambiguous language. So if I were to try to define a cat and I were to tell you that it is an endothermic, hair-bearing quadruped that is nocturnal and carnivorous, um, if you haven't taken biology yet, you're like, what? You stepped in what? Um, and so <laughs> make sure that you use words that the reader can understand, okay? Um, that it's understandable that the definition uses only words that have been previously defined or are clearly understood without being defined. So if we're talking about a surface and uh, in geometry, and a surface is a set of points um, that, uh, that follow a three-dimensional object, but I haven't defined a, a point yet, and I haven't defined a set yet, I shouldn't use those words to define a surface. Um, don't, uh, make sure that, that a definition is reversible, that the definition identifies the class to which the object belongs and its, and its distinguishing characteristics, that from a definition you can go to other objects and the definition helps you bridge the concept from object to object. Um, it should also be concise. You don't want long definitions. If you look up uh, a word in Webster's Dictionary, the definition is never pages long because definitions should be short. If you have to take 75 words to define something, you've done a bad job. Um, and it should be objective. You don't want the definition to be like ice cream and have uh, the word is ice cream and the definition is something like my favorite is chocolate. Well, that doesn't matter. I don't care what your favorite is. Tell me what ice cream is. So make sure that it's objective, that it's not subjective. We don't have um, judgmental words, emotional words, figures of speech, or things that are only true for me where I am now. Okay? So those are some things that make up a good definition. Don't lose too much sleep over those. The definitions in your textbook are good. Um, you will have to look at some definitions in this unit and say that they are good or bad definitions. But um, again, it's okay. Uh, let's move on to how geometry uses definitions. This figure is actually from the next section of your textbook, but I wanted to pull it in now because it helps you see what we're doing. There are only three undefined terms in geometry, things that you can't really get a good definition for. You can describe them, but you can't really get a, a good definition for it. So we allow three undefined terms. We'll get to what those are in the next slide or two. Uh, and then there are tons of things with definitions. You're going to get like 10 of them in this lecture. Uh, lots and lots of defined terms. We we'll use those defined terms to build things called postulates, which are statements that are self-evidently true, that you don't have to prove, that you can, you can just think about for a minute and understand that this is a true thing. And then there are theorems, which are statements that have to be proven, that are not self-evidently true. Um, and the next unit is going to help you understand your first couple of postulates, your first couple of theorems. But for, uh, for now, I just wanted you to see that some undefined terms are accepted. Um, then we have truckloads of definitions that we will need to understand before we can start stating postulates and theorems later on. All right. I said that mathematicians allow three undefined terms in geometry. Here's what they are. Um, the first one is a point. A point is a dot or a location with no length, width, or thickness. It's a location in space. It has no dimensions. It has no size. So in this day and age, I know you're not supposed to bring your cell phone to class, but you probably all have one in your backpack anyway. Um, imagine if 
someone were to ask you, and of course not in class, you're, uh, you're walking to school, um, and somebody asks you, where are you right now? And you can, on most phones, send them your location. And then that person gets a text with a picture of a map and a pin on it. And the pin is pointing to you. And if they were to zoom in, the pin doesn't get any bigger. The pin stays the same size because the pin is dimensionless. The pin is just saying, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. It's pointing. It's a point, right? It does not have any size. It's just indicating a location. That's what a point is. We will call them out in geometry with a dot. Even though a dot has dimension, it's a certain size. It's however big your pin or your pencil is. Um, but it's the dot representing just a location, okay? And we oftentimes put a, a letter there. We usually put a letter there to identify, excuse me, to identify that location as different from some other location. And we could say point P with words, or we could put a dot and put P, okay? A line is a straight set of points extending infinitely in one dimension with no width or thickness. So um, a, a road is a good um, analogy of a line. It's not perfectly a line because a road has width, but a, a, a road goes that way and it goes that way and it doesn't go that way, right? If you're on the way, you're on the road, you're driving down the road, you can go front or back, but you can't go side to side, ignore the changing lanes highway thing, right? We're talking about like a narrow country road. Um, and so a, a line is like that. It's all the points in an infinitely long straight line that has no width or depth. Okay, just length. Um, we would draw a line and we could indicate points on that line and that would be uh, the line M or the line that has points C and D on it. So we could say that it's line CD, we could just use words to say line CD or we could put CD with a double arrow above it and that means the line that includes points CD. Now, if you just say CD with no arrow and you don't use the word line in front, I'm going to say you're wrong because now you're just talking about two points, right? Line CD or CD with the line symbol under it. Now, lines go both directions, so it doesn't matter where you start or stop. You could say DC and that's the same thing as CD, right? Or you could just say line M because in this particular example, they've said they put a little M there saying this is line M. Okay. A plane, a plane is a flat surface made of points extending infinitely in two dimensions, but it has no thickness. So think of a, a bed sheet or a piece of paper that's flat and it goes this way. Now a bed sheet or a piece of paper runs into a boundary. Imagine a bed sheet that wraps the universe, right? It just keeps going forever in two dimensions, but it has no third dimension. That's a plane. A plane we can indicate with a letter as well. In the example here, this is uh, a little letter K here saying that this is plain K. Or we could say it's plain FGH because it's the plane that contains these points. Now, for it to be a plane, we have to call out three points, and you'll understand why in a few lessons. But you can't say plain FH because between F and H, there's only a line. You have to say plain FGH, call out three points on the plane to identify the plane. Okay? Um, space. Space is the set of all points, kind of like the universal set is everything in the universe. Space is, is all the points anywhere, any location that you can identify. If you pick a bunch of points on a line, then you've picked collinear points. So if you're ever stuck in traffic on, on H1, coming into school, because you live in Eva, um, and you're sitting on the freeway, and you're looking at the back of the car, and that's looking at the back of the car in front of it, and somebody's looking at the back of your car, Think of all the cars in your lane as points for a moment, review your geometry, and all of those cars in a line, you're collinear points. You're all in a straight line as long as you're on a straight part of the freeway, right? And all of those points are collinear. Now there's also non-collinear points, which would be like my car, because by the time you're in traffic, I'm probably already at work. So my car is parked at work, your car is with everybody else in that lane. We represent non-collinear points. I'm not in your line. Right? I'm somewhere else. Um, concurrent lines are lines whose intersection is a single point. Now, that's part of the definition of an intersection of lines, is lines only ever intersect at one point. But lines don't have to intersect. So concurrent lines are lines that intersect. And whenever lines intersect, they only intersect at one point. Because lines aren't curvy. Lines are straight. 
and you when you have two straight lines that touch each other, they only touch each other in one place. Okay. Moving on. Let's do a couple of examples here. So let's just use this image to identify some uh, examples of these de defined terms that we've come up with. Let's find three collinear points. Well, collinear means they all have to be on the same line. So W, T, and B, these three lines are not on the same line. They're not collinear. T, B, and S, however, are on the same line. They're collinear. T and R are collinear, but we've been asked to find three collinear points. Three non-collinear points R. S and V, not on the same line. They do not represent one line, so they are not collinear. Okay? Three concurrent lines. Those are lines that intersect. So uh, line N and line K, they intersect at point T. They're concurrent. Line M and line K, they intersect at point R. They're concurrent. Line I and line M, they intersect at point S. They're concurrent. Okay? So we found three sets of concurrent lines. Let's look at a couple more examples. Sorry, first we have some more terms. Um, Non-coplanar and coplanar points, just like collinear and non-collinear points. These are points that are in the same plane. So a plane is a flat surface that goes forever in two dimensions but has no depth. Um, so if you find three points that are all in that plane, you've defined the plane and you found coplanar points. If you were to pick a point that is not in that plane, you found non-coplanar points. So here's my little desk. Uh, any location on this desk is a coplanar point, and then this point up here is non-coplanar. It does not belong to the set of points on the plane, right? Coplanar and non-coplanar. Skew. These are lines that are not parallel, but they do not intersect. They are not um, lines that ever touch, but they also are not lines that go next to each other. So these are lines that are in different planes. These are lines that are in different planes. They are not coplanar, and the plane that one line is in never touches the plane that the other line is in, and so they don't ever intersect. Okay, We'll give you some examples of those. And then parallel lines are lines that never intersect but are in the same plane. And so they are coplanar lines that do not intersect. Think of um, like railroad tracks. And there's not a lot of trains on this island, but I'm sure you've seen a railroad track at some point in your life where you have one rail and the other rail, and they go along in straight lines and they never touch. If these rails ever touch, the train would fall off the track and, you know, luggage and cows would go everywhere and that would be a problem. So uh, parallel lines are lines that are in the same plane and never intersect. And we have that little symbol of drawing two parallel lines to represent parallel. Okay? And then parallel planes, just like you have parallel lines that never intersect, you have parallel planes that never intersect. If you took one piece of paper and another piece of paper and you held one above the other, this plane and this plane don't touch each other, so they are parallel planes. And you'll see lots of examples of those as we move on. Okay? Finally, some more examples. Here we go. Let's get my picture out of the way. Um, use the cube to name the following. Tell me four coplanar points. Four coplanar points. Well, A, J, E, and H are all on this plane of the cube. And so they're coplanar. You could also pick K, D, C, and L. They're all on this side of the cube. They're all coplanar. Okay? Four non coplanar points C, A, F, and K. You could not draw a plane that captures all four of those points, so they are non coplanar. Use the cube name the following two pairs of coplanar lines. So line EH and line AD are in the same plane. They're both on the plane on this side of the cube. AE and EH are coplanar. They're both on the plane that is this side of the cube. Okay? Two sets of parallel lines. Well, AD and EH coplanar, and they never intersect, so they're parallel. HG and FE are coplanar. They're both on the bottom plane of this cube. They're coplanar, and they never intersect, so they're parallel. Okay? You've used these words before in common speech. We're just applying them to their actual home set uh, here in geometry. And lastly, let's find two pairs of skew lines. So these are lines that don't intersect, but they're not parallel. 
So let's look at uh, line BC and line EF. Notice that they never touch each other, but that's not because they are going the same direction. E and F, or EF is going in and out of the page, and BC is going along the page. They're just in two different planes, and their planes, because they're, the two lines are in different planes, they never intersect each other, so they're skewed, okay? Find a pair of parallel planes. Well, the plane that is represented by the front face of this cube, which we could call plane uh, AEH, and the plane that's representing the back of the cube, BCG, this plane and this plane are uh, parallel. They never intersect. They, they represent uh, parallel slices through the universe, right? Okay, that's the end of this lesson. If you have any questions, let me know tomorrow. I'll see you. We'll go through Q&A, and then uh, I'll, we'll work on this concept together. So um, I'll see you. I hope you have a great night. God bless you. Jesus loves you.